as Dave Mercer would say, he went from mowing lawns to mowing down the classic competition. Justin Hamner is your 2024 Bassmaster Classic champion. That and more on episode 170 of the Inside Bassmaster Podcast. I'm your host as usual, Ronnie Moore. My co-host, like always, Kyle, Jesse, and Kyle. We just wrapped up the Super Bowl of Bass Fishing, the Bassmaster Classic. And it was in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the BOK Arena for the weigh-ins at the Cox Convention Center for the Expo. We had our live outdoor bass live set at the Bass Pro Shops Outdoor Tailgate. And then we had all the festivities that matter on the water at Grove, Oklahoma, at Grand Lake. And you got to be a part of the lake activities and brought it back to the weigh-in on the final day. So what a great week it was. I know uh, Tulsa showed out big time, especially compared to past Tulsa years. Yeah, it was fantastic. You know, I mean, there was a few... I say a few, there was more than a few moments throughout the week where I was just blown away at the fan support. First one being uh, the first morning of takeoff. It's cold, it's raining, raining, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people lined up as far as you can basically see on the hill there at at Wolf Creek, um, you know, there to watch takeoff. And it was like that every single day, but it being Friday, a work day, raining, terrible conditions, all the things, and there are still just so many people there. Uh, and then the the final weigh-in, you know, I didn't get to go to the first two days weigh-in because it's, you know, obviously a haul to get there, so we just stayed in Grove. But um, the final day, man, the entire low, lower bowl full, the entire floor full, and you could look up to the upper deck, and it was like the sections that were available to sit in were, like, pretty full. I mean, it was incredible the amount of people that were there. And like you said, um, you know, we go to so many great host cities for the classic. You just never know how to compare it. And it doesn't make one greater than the other or anything like that. It just, you know, it just varies a lot. Like, you know, weekend of the year that it happens and all the kind of things that matter, you know, to go into attendance. There was just so many people. And it was it was really awesome to see, um, you know, even on the water, you know, the flotillas. A lot of the guys talked about it on stage, of course, but you know, the, the fan support on the water, even watching and the respect level that those fans had on the water, you know, to, to, you know, stay away and not get in their way and everything. I mean, it was really, really, really cool. Um, you know, it's an area I, I'm super fond with having gone to school in Fayetteville. Like we spent a lot of time in East Oklahoma. So, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I can speak from, from my perspective and, and I'm sure that, you know, the fans of, of that part of the country really enjoyed it as well. Yeah, it's a place that uh, I went for the 2016 Classic, and I got to experience Grove, and I was up there on the waters with the last Classic I covered on the water before going to Bass Live and doing the, um, obviously, live shows in the arenas and the convention center. Um, man, Grand is a, a special lake. It's it's very straightforward yet confusing as well, so I know it threw some anglers for a loop. Uh, it's odd also how it ties in Oklahoma anglers, you know, Christy, Palmer, even Evers, dating back to his time, did well at Hartwell in South Carolina and the Carolinas, the way they fished. They just, they, they did well at that lake. And how Matt Airy, Hank Cherry, Shane LeHue all have done well in the classic or other events at Grand Lake. And so how the Carolinians do well. And, and so there's something that remains to be seen about that. Um, but also, when you see our top five and you see some past winners here in opens, even on the co-angler side, the upper Midwest, the Wisconsin, Minnesota region, that angler contingent always seems to do well at Grand Lake. I think Seth Fighter had a great elite event here in 2018. You had Bob Downey win an open there. Um, I think, you know, Jay Shakir won a co-angler event from the back of the boat in an open there. And then you have Adam Rasmussen and you have Jay Shakir in the top five of the Bassmaster Classic. It's very a unique body of water that's not as straightforward as people think. Like it's you can go do something, but um, I think like the anglers will attest, and our guests today will probably attest as well. It's ever changing. Yes, you can run a pattern, but that pattern is going to slightly adjust, or the region you need to be in the depth zone may slightly adjust day to day. And so we'll get into that and more. Our guest today is Justin Hamner, 2024 Bassmaster Classic champion. And like we introed with, Dave Mercer said it said it greatly on the stage. Uh, his former, his past career of mowing lawns and mowing grass for a living is no more. He has left that behind, 
fully invested in tournament bass fishing at the Bassmaster Elite Series level. And boy, has the last calendar year been prosperous for him. Had such a good end of last year. Uh, had a chance to win the final event at the St. Lawrence. Had a chance to win some of the other events like um, Champlain. Then we start out the year, and he's doing fantastic at Toledo. Had the best catch of the week there with that jig, with a big mop jig fish on a brush pile. And then uh, almost wins and gets the sixth or seventh largest uh, tournament weight ever at Fork. Rolls that into a Bassmaster Classic victory this past week. So we'll get to talk to Justin on this episode of the podcast. But let's go through quickly um, because we'll cover this in some other videos we put out. But the way the top five lined out on the final day, we do the Super Six, and it's the six going into the final day how they are. Some of those fall fell. Some of those rose up. I think three stayed in the top six and three supplanted others and jumped in there. Um, but kudos to the top five. Lee Livesey in fifth place, Jay Shakira in fourth, Cody Huff in third, Adam Rasmussen in second, and then you had Justin Hamner in the top spot. So who did you get to cover on the water during the Classic, Kyle, um, throughout the weekend? And did you see any of those other guys in the regions of the English you covered? I did. Yeah. I got to cover a variety of different guys. You know, the first day being Luke Palmer, I uh, rode with him in the morning, of course, and, uh, down then, Lake real, real yes. far down Lake. Correct. And then, uh, actually where I was covering him was not as far as he ended up fishing, you know, when he had his better days, but, uh, still fairly far. Um, and then, you know, later that day started or ended up with Cody Huff. Obviously he had a fantastic day one, fantastic tournament in general, um, but covered him on day one as well. Started with him day two. Brandon Card was in the same creek. Um, a lot of these guys that did really well were in the same general area of the lake, uh, which made it super easy for coverage sake, of course. Um, and like I said, got to cover Brandon Card. And then on the final day, um, ended up throwing an audible and covering Adam Rasmussen, which was which was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, he obviously had a great final day and and made it really interesting. And, you know, that's really from a fan standpoint and uh, just a viewership standpoint in general, uh, that's really all you can ask for is somebody to make it interesting on the last day. Um, it never fails. That almost always ends up being the case in the Bassmaster Classic. But, um, you know, when Justin Hamner has the lead that he does going into the final day, you're like, I don't really know if he's going to, like, let up at all. Like, I don't know that there's going to be enough of a moment in time where you're like, you know what? Like Justin Hamner might leave the door open here, but uh, but Adam did his job on that final day and caught a caught a really nice bag and um started out quick and he caught you know some really nice ones first thing so um it was a really fun tournament never had the opportunity to cover Justin but um pretty much you know a handful of the other guys in the top ten I, I did get the chance to cover and it was a really fun event from that standpoint for sure. Well, and Adam, let's just go, uh, you know, because we're going to talk to Justin about his pattern. Uh, Adam was fishing, you know, shallower brush piles, that four to four to eight foot um, on really, I guess, do nothing banks nearby. It wasn't really much of nothing. You could just overlook it. The lake was low in terms of it will be higher later in the year for summer pool, but it wasn't abnormally low for winter pool. This is just normally where it is. It's just you see exposed banks, it's lower. So Adam was fishing in that four to eight foot range. Maybe that's the seven to 10 foot range when the water's up. But those small brush piles were key for him. He's thrown a jig and thrown a spinner bait. And I'll let you get into more of what you were noticing out there. But one very cool aspect, I always find myself rooting for like everyone in the top five because I'm like, that would be a cool story. That would be a cool story. Yeah. That would be a cool story. If Adam were to win that, because he is not an Elite Series pro, he would have gained entry into the Elite Series. He would have punched his ticket as classic champ to defend his title the next year, and he would be a rookie on the Elite Series in 2025, which would have been a cool first to happen because we really haven't had – I'd have to go back, you know, the 99 – obviously 99 was Davey Height, but the, the 90s to 2000s before the Elite Series was formed – I still think touring pros won the classic. The only person to ever win the classic that wasn't a touring pro was Brian Kirchel from the Bass Nation. And that was still his second classic, getting last in the first classic he ever fished and getting first in the second classic he ever fished. Um, so he was, uh, you know, kind of in the same situation Justin Hammer was, second classic. And so Adam Rasmussen, um, Rasmussen, would have made the Elite Series and it would have been a very unique storyline to see unfold as a guy who's won an Open He's won a nation regional all in the last calendar year. And boy, 
to win the classic would have been huge for him. So what else did you notice other than just the straightforward shallow brush piles, four to eight with a br- with a jig and a and a spinnerbait? Yeah, so I didn't – again, I, I only covered him the final day, so I didn't really know what to expect going into the final day. And I'm setting that up because it was funny watching him, you know, when you associate a spinnerbait, it's not to say you don't – associate it with like throwing it over shallow brush piles i'm not trying to suggest that at all but when you're watching from a a perspective of you know 20 to 100 yards out and you're watching a guy throw a spinner in what looks like the abyss like just in the middle of nothing um it was an interesting thing to look at and you could tell just based on the the land and everything else like you could tell his big flats and and areas that you knew shallow cover was around but it wasn't visible so you're sitting there watching a guy and I, you know, I remember one of the first photos I sequences I took, I, I, you know, I zoom in on one of the photos and he's throwing not just a spinner bait, but like a, a Colorado blade spinner bait, like a, a spinner bait with a thumper blade. And I'm like, this is so weird to put all these pieces together. Like, again, when you is associate that thing, like a is that thumper, thing bubbling under the surface, like what is that thing doing? Is he when, it's when, you're, when you're thinking about like a, a thumper blade spinner bait, at least for me anyways, it's like throwing it at something, you know what I mean? Like a lay down. Um, like Christy did, you know, in, in, in the last classic, like you look at things like that and that's what you associate throwing a uh, big spinnerbait like that. But obviously he had a, a crazy good game plan dialed in um, on these flats. I mean, the area was rather large, like it was a big area, but he had little sweet spots where he would make a 50 yard run or make a hundred yard run. And it was all within one little area, but, you know, obviously did a really good job rotating through those spots um you know that last day there being some really heavy winds um some of that stuff that he was fishing was a little more protected um which was great because we didn't have to run around in the in the big waves or anything but it, even more than that like he was you know you could tell was fishing areas strategically that were going to be protected by the wind and you know to get some early bites like he did um early on that final day certainly uh you know, allowed him to know he was doing the right thing and, and kind of ran with it all day. And, and, you know, towards the end, obviously had us a little lull and, you know, if that's what you want to call it and kind of slowed down a little bit, but um, you know, his morning was fantastic and it looked like he was really gonna, gonna, you know, chase down Hamner or at least give him a, a good run. And he certainly did. Yeah. And that's what I was saying to people. They're like, what are the, what are the odds that he could make up the bass track deficit? And I said, well, Hamner hadn't caught really many big ones, so his weight can't be skewed that much. And I think on Bass Track at the time, he had like 13 pounds, and uh, Rasmussen had 16.11. Well, Hamner catches one on his final cast and upgrades by a pound or a pound and a half and gets to that 15-pound mark that we know later at weigh-in. But when I was saying, you know, Hamner or Rasmussen had 16.11 on Bass Track, but all but one of his fish were like four-pounders. So if you think to do the math, that's four for four, that's 16. And then he's got a two, two and a half, three pounder. He's got to have 18 pounds and he ends up having 18 pounds. And and if, if Hamner doesn't catch that final fish, then he may only be a pound off the pace. It might've been a lot closer and nerve wracking. And so Rasmussen had a great week. Um, you mentioned Cody Huff. He had a great day one and he caught him quick. He was up on the top of the leaderboard pretty early in the day. Um, 20 pounds. He was the first one to break 20 pounds and he did so in, in just inches of water, it seems, in the way back in the back of horse where even locals couldn't get to, it seemed, and they didn't know they didn't know that you could get back there at that time. And it was one of those things that Cody had found in practice that held up on day one. Then they catch him so good that you're wondering, will it hold up on day two? And halfway through day two, he's got nothing to show for it, and he's got to make an adjustment. And so he does and salvages his day on docks. Then we see him mix in windy banks and docks the final day, and he rides good momentum from second starting the week to finishing third in the Bassmaster Classic and getting a, a forty thousand dollar payday, I think. So I think it's three hundred and then fifty and then forty, um, and then it'll go down some more from there until it gets to you know obviously ten grand for everybody below the cut. But um, great week for Cody, and honestly, we said Luke Palmer, we put him on camera because he's from Oklahoma. But Cody Huff in in eastern Missouri, southeastern Missouri, is actually closer proximity distance wise than Luke Palmer is. Yeah, and Cody Huff's you know game plan was really really awesome to see. I, I really thoroughly enjoyed watching him fish. There was two things that he well 
one thing that he said, and then I'll, I'll kind of get around to the story of, uh, you know, of, of his second day. Uh, the first day, obviously we go to him and at the time he's, you know, I don't know exactly what he's got on Bass Track, but I don't know, call it 15 or 16 pounds. And he's doing well. He's in the top five and we pull up to him. He makes, he's in the very back of, of the Creek you're talking about. I mean, way back there, kicking up mud with this trolling motor. I mean, like back there. And uh, he comes out, goes to this little secondary spot, and within, I don't know, a minute, two minutes, he catches a big one. Um, and then literally like three or four minutes later, he catches another big one, and that gets him up to, you know, 20 or whatever he ended up with um, throughout the day. And he starts idling out, and Cody Huff is obviously a well-known, you know, angler using forward-facing sonar, electronics in general, like – not in a bad way, just he's really good at it. That's something he's one of the guys that got on it really early. And uh, he was idling by me and he looked at me and he said, he said, you got to watch them scopers in this tournament after he just caught two, like four pounders in like a foot of water. And I just died laughing. And I said, dude, you know, that's what everybody's going to think too after day one weigh in. Like they're going to see your weight and everybody's going to be like, dad, gummit, I need to be off the bank. Like everybody you know, ties I, up their Demiki, you know their jig yeah. head minnows and cody's yeah. over here like putting on his square bills literally and... <laughs> but you know it, it's funny though and i don't i don't want to speak for cody obviously but i'm just kind of using uh you know my knowledge base of fishing the white river lakes and and watching what he was doing you know that style of fishing is not super uncommon you know finding the flats a little bit dirtier stained water and then isolated wood you know like up the war eagle on on beaver um you know sugarloaf creek some of the places on be on bull shoals that you can get in the far back of and find stuff like that it's it's a very popular you know pattern technique for uh white river lakes and watching him do that on day one was just a thing of beauty because like i love fishing that way myself which doesn't matter what i think but just watching him like he was doing it to per perfection i mean like with a you know square bill and then flipping a jig and the things that he was doing uh it was really really awesome but i had a bad suspicion on day two and like i said i don't speak for him because it might have been something completely different but the cold front that moved in on day two like 30 obviously, degrees the wind yeah, started never, really blowing never helps that kind of bite that's kind of a given obviously when those fish are so shallow like that water temperature you know i assume can can adjust them pretty quickly um, and then two, it's a technique in the springtime that like is reliant on sun. Like, and I'm not saying it like, it's the only way you can catch them. But like, I told my boat driver, Shane, I said, I have a bad feeling and I hope I'm wrong, but I have a bad feeling that this deal is going to be going away until it gets sunny or it gets warm because like, there's just not much water for those fish to be in. And if it's not sunny, a lot of times those fish are not going to get on something. If that makes sense. Like they're just yeah. going to run like and, and the odds you're catching resident fish, you need good weather to repopulate the area. They're not just 100%. so plentiful already stacked in there. Yeah. hundred percent. And like I said, I, I'm not speaking as if I'm an expert, but like, I just had a bad feeling and, you know, watching him that, that second morning, um, obviously it was, it was far, far tougher, uh, to get bit doing that and didn't get bit doing that. So, I mean, it was, it was tough, but that was the thing I was the most impressed with is the fact that he just scrapped that on a whim and took off and did other things and still kept himself in contention like that that's one of the things that will not get talked about a lot throughout like when you look back at this classic but like where cody huff was at that morning having to idle away from his like spot that produced all the weight the day before and just scrap it and still keep himself in contention when things just looked really bad like and i'm saying that from my perspective like i left him because i was like i don't i don't think this is gonna happen today boss like we gotta go somewhere else um, and for him to make what he did out of that day was, I mean, incredibly, incredibly, uh, you know, impressive. So, um, you know, to keep himself in contention was a, a, a huge thing. It's one thing to turn chicken, you know what, into chicken salad when you're in your kitchen or no one's watching. But when there's a camera in your boat on day two of the Bassmaster Classic, it's oh. hard to get all the ingredients lined up to oh. turn that into perfection. So kudos yeah. to Cody Huff. I actually got to have me and my wife got to have dinner with him and his wife. Um, right before the tournament. I, I can't, I'm trying to think of when it was. It was either right before the official day of practice, final official day, or if it was uh, – no, I guess it was. It would, it would have had to be Tuesday after the meetings and everything before the next day of practice. And so um, cool to see that he discovered that, kept it in his back pocket, and then utilized it on Friday well. Um, Jay Shakurit, fourth place, man. Him and 
Lee Livesey hung around the top 10 all week long. Most of our guys did, but Jay uh, had two things going. He had a jerk bait in the offshore brush piles, you know, a little bit off the bank, a little bit more. Had that going early on day one with a jerk bait, and then he really transitioned to a jig and utilized that jig well, and that ended up being his go-to the rest of the week as that jerk bait bite faded. But Jay, man, he's starting to be one of the solid dudes, catching him on a grimy Tennessee River Classic that was cold and brutal weather conditions and ever-changing. Caught him and was in the top 10 at that Classic last year and then caught him this year in this Classic fourth place. I'm starting to think that those rivers in Wisconsin, me and you are going to have to go up there and see if they're really like that because – he said they're grinder lakes and grinder rivers, but that's got to be like, hey, let me get familiar with this type of fishing because that's that's something that maybe being an opens angler or a co-angler has taught him. But, man, to see it click like that in the classic was was cool because Jay is, Jay is the real deal. It's not just the 100-pound smallmouth win at the St. Lawrence. That's not the only place he's deadly. I think he's actually deadlier elsewhere, honestly. Yeah, and you look at it, there's two things to take away from that as well as the fact that um, you know, it's something you and I have talked about on the podcast with a variety of different guests, but you know, the Midwest angle, obviously like the, the amount of strength of, of anglers that are coming from that region. Um, and two things, you know, second thing being like, you just assume that every young, you know, based on, if you just read comments on Instagram, yeah. that every single you young too. angler that catches them is only catching them because of, of their electronics and things like that. Well, this tournament, I don't necessarily know would, um, you know, would reflect that because again, like we were talking about with Cody Huff, um, mostly what he was doing had nothing to do with it. Jay Shakira, I know was fishing offshore, but like it was a lot of, you know, traditional old school type fishing, which we kind of expected with Grand Lake. Obviously it just kind of always fishes like that, uh, in the springtime, but, um, with a you little know. influx of like, hey, I'm going to use my electronics to be efficient on sure. the cover. No I'm question. Not, I'm not in the abyss of dropping down on fish, yes. We're not chasing around. Old school techniques with new school yeah. ways of approaching it. So th th that's the point I guess I'm trying to make is that the, sure. you know, they're so well-rounded. I think it's it's just unfair to them to assume that the only reason some of these guys have success is because of their electronics. I just don't think that. It's, no, that it's dispelling a lot of things we used to think about these fish and so these guys are just noticing that a lot more and and greg hackney said it in an interview you know the tuesday interviews he says i am good enough to be stubborn and still have success so it's gonna be a lot harder for me to adapt to that style of fishing because i feel i can still be pretty successful in the ways that i've used to catch them and no fault of your own at all, but there will be a time where maybe it's less successful than it used to be. The ceiling of I'm on my A game, I can lose two or three fish and win this tournament. You won't be able to lose two or three fish anymore. You'll you'll have to be on your A game and you'll have to be perfect to still make some of those things, you know, go wire to wire in a tournament or win, do those things. You have to out duel um, because the number of shots on goal guys may have with new technology is just going to be more. So, uh, but yeah. That's a good problem to have if you're Greg Hackney. I'm too good at fishing my own way, so I'm stubborn. I, I, nobody's blaming you at one bit. Um, but he knows the power of it as well. Let's go to uh, Lee Livesey, fifth place, before we invite Justin Hamner in the podcast. Uh, cranking. Man, we had he caught some on a jig, some on a chatterbait, but a lot of numbers came on a square bill and being able to crank down the bank. So utilizing a crankbait for quantity, utilizing a jig and a chatterbait for quality for Lee Livesey. Yeah, I didn't get to see a whole lot of, of what Lee was doing on the water. I Matter of fact, I only saw him in that same creek that we were referencing earlier where you'd find uh, Cody Huff in certain areas and then Brandon Card in certain areas. Um, all three of those guys, though, fishing that creek, like I said, different varieties of, of you know, places, um, all had success fishing a crankbait. So, um, like I said, I didn't get to see him on the water, so I couldn't I couldn't give you a detailed explanation as to what he was doing necessarily. But uh, no, but, but it's yeah. the same thing. I mean, it's you find yeah. a cinder block that's half under mud, half not, and you catch you know off the four pounder off the corner of a cinder block, and you've got a lay down sticking up. You know, here's this one stick. You catch one on it. So Lee balanced it well. But one thing about Lee 
is that when the the lights are brightest and the game is the biggest, he shows up. That's uh, four Bassmaster Classics and four top 15s. That was my reasoning for him being a dark horse contender for winning the event, coming into the event for me was it doesn't matter where we've been, whether I guess it's a, a Gunnersville, um, what was the classic in 21? A Gunnersville, a Fort Worth, or a, you know, a, a Hartwell, a Tennessee River, or Grand Lake, any one of those, he'll find a way in this this time of year and this tournament to be able to show up and, and get a top 15 finish. So another top 15 for him, if there were prop bets, which is a big hot topic in all of sports, including yours, baseball, um, prop bets on athletes. If there was for Lee Livesey, top 15 in the classic, let's just go ahead and lock that one in as being one that we would keep an eye on for him. So there's your top five other than the Bassmaster Classic champion. So why don't we go ahead and bring on the man who dominated wire to wire. He is the 10th angler to win a classic wire to wire. And it's the 11th instance. The Rick Clun has won two classics wire to wire um, with the likes of, let me think Jeff Gustafson, Hank Cherry, Cliff Pace, uh, Luke Clawson. Uh, you've got Stanley Mitchell, Bo Dowden, Hank Parker, Rick Clun twice. Um, there may be like one more that I'm forgetting have all won the classic wire to wire. And so kudos to Justin Hamner for winning wire to wire. And he puts his name on that list and two classics in for Hamner, two top fives for him. So he may be on that Livesey track uh, right now, but let's join our guests or let's bring our guest in so he can join us on the podcast. Well, Kyle, there's no better guest to have on the inside Bassmaster podcast after the Bassmaster classic than the champ himself. So Justin Hamner, congratulations. Welcome into the podcast, the 2024 Bassmaster classic champion. Man, this is crazy. I don't even know what's happening. Look at, all that, I can, Look at that thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> all I can think about is how worn out I am, and I didn't I didn't make a single cast. I didn't have to deal with any of the stuff that you have. What I mean, just like the best you can. Just describe what the last, I don't know, 72 hours, however long it's been since it's happened. Uh, what's it been like, and have you had a second to breathe yet? Uh, no, no breathing. And... Uh, this thing might get thrown in the river here soon. <laughs> it has been insane. No, for real though, I, I can't be grateful enough for all the people that's reached out just wanting to talk to me. It's been awesome. I'm still trying to catch up on these texts. I mean, it's like, I, dude, the first morning I woke up, whatever, that Monday morning, I think it was like 380 something text messages. <laughs> it has been insane. I can't thank everybody enough. And I promise I will try to get back to you. It might be a month. <laughs> how many people from there. your uh from your kindergarten math class that you haven't talked to in 25 30 years how many of them have texted you and been like hey justin we went to <laughs> tuscaloosa you know <laughs> elementary school together <laughs> i don't even know i haven't made it that far down the list <laughs> <laughs> yeah. those are you've only answered all the texts that you have stored in your phone as contacts there's a bunch of numbers you don't even know <laughs> i was about oh, to dude, say thanks up meeting I got to imagine you never realized how many friends you had until you won the Bassmaster Classic. <laughs> no doubt. They're coming out of the woodworks. I just looked out the window as, out of the double wide, and there's like three people in the woods over here. <laughs> <laughs> you sure that's not Shane Durant's and Sago? Because they were in the woods at Lake Fork and got and got shot at or, or almost shot at in the, on the final. I think it was the final day of the tournament. Did you ever hear about that, Justin? No. Yeah. Please tell so, me. So Trey McKinney at Lake Fork goes into this little shallow pocket. It's got timber on the outside of it. It's got a dock up in there. It's where he, you know, snapped his rod, all these other stuff. So he goes up in there and the photographers have to stay way far back away from the timber or they have to go around somehow. And so they get off on land and they're in the woods taking photos of him. And some lady comes bearing a, a revolver looking deal walking out. <laughs> And was like, what are you doing in my in my property? And they're like, we're just taking photos of the fishermen. And, and then she didn't, and she just walked back inside. But it was like, what is going on for a second? So <laughs> if you have anybody in your woods, just walk out there and say, are you taking photos? And they'll just walk. They'll just go. They'll leave. Okay. Um, that's I don't know. I might go more of the revolver route. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny well hey justin we didn't uh we didn't necessarily bring you on the podcast to talk about that we wanted to talk about the bassmaster classic but i know you've been super busy we're shooting this thursday afternoon after the classic so you've had a couple days 
what you you've obviously covered a lot of classic ground and we'll talk about that in a moment but has there been anything that hasn't been asked yet you've been asked the same question probably 20 times has there been anything that you've been waiting to discuss or talk about that no one's really keyed in on uh and if so the floor is open to you sir you can talk about whatever you want to uh and and we'll ask that question nobody's asked me how i get my hair looking so good um, I was a little worried. It, it was it was pretty far down on your on your on your boat idle around. around. Yeah, yeah. It it pert plus pert plus. Just go ahead and <laughs> shout them out. <laughs> no, honestly, I can't even remember all of the things that people has asked me and stuff. But I don't know the whirlwind. That that's one thing that we could kind of talk about. The whirlwind has been for me and my wife has been insane. The so whenever we got back you know, after the celebration toast and everything like that. You know, my wife, she still cuts hair. She was actually going to school, too, to get a, another, like, degree in something else and all this. Um, Yeah, the first thing, first thing I said to her when we sat down in the hotel room was, yeah, I just fired you and you just got a big promotion. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. It's been stressful, but. I want to shout out to her because she's been like the one organizing, trying to set up all these phone calls and meetings and craziness. And she's handled it pretty dang good. So I don't know. I wish I had a really cool, funny story for everybody, but it's just been a lot of phone calls. No, I mean, well, <laughs> there's been more cameras on you in the last, you know, six, seven days of your life than there has been previously. So we've seen almost everything that everything's been touched uh, very well in conversations and whatnot. And it's hard to miss out on things. So uh, congratulations. It is a whirlwind, but it's obviously a, a, a huge responsibility being the Bassmaster Classic champion, a huge opportunity as well. Even though the tournament doesn't pay, you know, a million dollars, the opportunity to maybe make and take advantage of a $300,000 win and, and turn it into a million in the future with endorsements or opportunities or sponsorships, Hopefully that does come to fruition um, and whatever deals you already have, maybe they go up from the amount of exposure you've given to brands and stuff. I know that wearing a certain hat on stage or running a certain boat and motor, they get, you get little perks incentives in your deals. And so hopefully those all enormously benefited you more than what the final paycheck that at least bass fans know you won, you know, that I hope, I hope that's yeah. the case. I do too. That would be awesome. <laughs> no, it's been crazy. I, I guess I do have a, maybe a small announcement have y'all ever heard of mileage t yes you got it please yeah. tell me yes <laughs> i'm not even kidding that was gonna Let's be my go. next question my Let's next question go. was gonna be if, if if any movement has been made on milo's t but you yeah. you know said it yeah i mean it's not like it's it, i mean it hadn't been all the paperwork hadn't been signed and all that stuff but there is some serious progress for it so yeah, I think it's going to happen. Is so. that an exclusive to this podcast? You haven't revealed that to an anybody exclusive. else? That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Way to bring the gas to the podcast. But Cut it. what an exclusive. We'll end it, we'll end it right there. Yep. That's all we I'll need for the day. Hey, at minimum, <laughs> whether, whether that deal makes you tens of thousands of dollars or it saves you tens of thousands of dollars, it's a win either way. Absolutely. That's what I said. It just – just getting free tea would probably save me like 10 or don't 15 tell, grand a hey, year. Don't tell them that. Don't tell <laughs> nope, them that. Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That is super cool. That is, that is fantastic. And you always yeah. hope that, yeah, that people outside of the fishing world notice that. So that is super. Awesome. I was almost about to hit up my boy Darian with y'all sweet tea and be like, yo, if Milo's don't scoop him up, you got to introduce him somehow to, to your brand and, and, and get him over since Canterbury's got red diamond. Uh, you got to corner the market somehow. And so I'm glad, I'm glad Milo's paid attention. I, I am too. It, it's going to be fun either way. Dude, if that is not the most genuine, just uh, artificial, whatever, not artificial. Organic. Either way. Yes. Organic. organic. Thank you, yes. Kyle. I'm not good with words. I've said too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to be like one of the most organic sponsorships. And I hope it happens. It'd be cool. Well, that's I got like a picture of my first, my rookie season. I don't know what tournament it was, but I was like in the boat and I'm out there with the whole gallon, like just drinking it by the jug. It's pretty cool. 
the more the more I've thought about this podcast, the more I've thought that we're gonna have a really hard time staying on track with anything. Because one thing I've said for years now, and I've said this even more in the last three days, is like the most fun thing to do with Justin Hamner is just be sarcastic and don't be serious at all. So like, yeah. I don't even know how we're gonna move forward with this. But <laughs> I was gonna ask Milo's obviously has the sweet tea, but they have the restaurants now. Are you a, a restaurant guy too? Because their food is fantastic. I eat their Dude, food. They have a- I mean, yeah, their cheeseburgers are good. <laughs> if you can't tell by my stature, I've had a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't build all this sexiness off of not just straight Milo's. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. Uh, so, so let's let's go back through uh, a couple moments and opportunities. Um, on that final day of the classic, you know, obviously everything leading up to that, it had been good, you know, very minimal lost fish, things like that. When you roll into places, it, it works out. Everything is just going to plan. Very rarely does a good practice or a, a good recipe for success end up translating, but it seemed like you were kind of putting the pieces together and it translated the first few days on that final day you had to make some adjustments. You hooked up with a giant. It ended up not being a bass right off the get go. And we thought you were about to slam the door in the first hour, but the kept the drama kept growing from there. Um, you lose some fish on the final day that would have, you know, bolstered your weight some. Uh, and then you started to really put your, you know, put the train back on the tracks, catch some fish. You make a decision, go run up there, pick up Robbie Floyd at the last hour of the day, last 30 minutes of the day. You catch one on your last cast. You make a coal as you're about to start the boat and head back. And then, boom, you're automatically in the arena, super six. All of those things happen. So to your best recollection, what were some of the moments that day that stuck out to you the most that was like, I'm super glad I zigged on a on – a, I decided to stop on that shallow brush pile or – I didn't get spun out when I saw Adam on my secondary juice and, and all that stuff. Yeah, I think that right there was one of the biggest things because I had literally been planning it because we knew that wind was coming like uh, all week. It's like Sunday is going to be brutal. And I actually found that brush where Adam ended up being, and I would not even go over there like the first two days. And I was trying to just save it for that Sunday. So when I went over there, and he, he was on it yeah and i was like okay well we got to find something i literally just ran around as like backside of this island with you could just see it like across the way it was slick calm so that's when i just went right over there and never been there before i wish i had practiced a little bit better and found some more brush piles over there <laughs> or any but yeah dude i literally just put the drilling matter down on one side of it and just like just pan around and looking and throwing a crankbait out the side as I was trying to find new brush piles. But I think that was that was the moment because I caught like two of my best fish. How cool is it to know like everyone wants to find the winning deal and to, to think that you found the winning deal and you found the secondary deal or the at least the winning area and then the secondary area that doesn't happen. So you and Grand Lake, I mean, did you take a few rocks from the shoreline back to Alabama with you just as mementos? Like Grand Lake, you got that's a that's that was a special, special week to find the winning deal and then to find the deal that the second place guy ended up almost, you know, cutting your lead in half with on the final day. Yeah. I didn't save any rocks. I wish I would have now. But yeah, that that is crazy. It, and it's it's really wild because I know I'm not the only guys that found that. Like especially the horse creek area. I mean, there is so many guys like that came up to us like, dude, that's the brush piles I was fishing and, you know, different stuff like that. But yeah, um, it's pretty wild. I don't know. I don't know how I did better. (laughs) That was one of the things I was going to ask because I got the chance to cover Adam on the on the last day. And there was a point in time exactly like you just described where you were on the backside of an island. I couldn't see your boat, but I could see the 40 other boats that were following you. <laughs> yeah. So I was pretty certain who it was. But, you know, you guys were fairly close to each other. Like, I, I don't even know how to, like, put this into words. But, like, did you ever notice him, like, either catching one? Or, like, did you, was there ever a moment in time where you kind of, like, caught yourself, like, noticing what was going on, like, elsewhere? Or, like, did you even, like, really pay it much attention once you, you know, settled into your spot? Uh, No. I mean, other than going over there and seeing you know that he was fishing there 
um, when I went to go over there, but no, I couldn't like to see him. And I, dude, I don't know why I didn't even care. It, like, it and just, it's not like, and it's not like it was super loud or there was anything that you would have noticed, but like the, the reason oh, I, yeah. Because throughout the day, he did start to gain more of a flotilla, which, like, as you guys know, like, the final day of the Classic, or really any tournament for that matter, like, little things like that, like, kind of key you into how things are going throughout the day. Like, it's not like your flotilla was leaving, but his was getting pretty big. And there was, you know, obviously a point in time fairly early where he had caught him um, pretty good. He had basically four four four-pounders and a two-pounder. That's how he had 18 pounds and change. And so it was one of those things of, like, as, and you don't even know this, Justin, but as soon as he got within half a pound of you on Bass Track, you caught a fish to cull up. I think you caught maybe one of your best fish of the day, and you culled two pounds, and you went to like a two-and-a-half-pound lead, and then dead silence for you and him until your last cast of the day. Like So, so he pulled all the way up right to your doorstep weight-wise, and then got quiet, and right at the same time, like 10 minutes later, you called up to extend it again, and then it was just radio silence from the top two the rest of the day until the last cast, which you didn't know that. Um, so that's my second question, or my segue is, you pull up to the dock after catching one in your last cast. Did you think you needed that fish to win the Classic? And then obviously after either looking at Bass Track or talking to people on the dock while you're loading up your boat, did you get a... a a nervous energy that you didn't win or a comforting that I think I did enough. Cause you did have almost a six pound lead. Yeah. When I caught that fish, I was like, that's going to help, but it ain't enough. I honestly, no doubt. I thought I had blown it. I was like, you know, that's cool. I wish it was like a six pounder and that might've been enough, but no, I was trying to do the math in my head. It's like, dude, he, uh, he, could have caught 21 or 22 pounds whatever it was and beat me and but I was still thinking that with those conditions somebody had like 25 you know it was just but then even when I rolled up to a dock like two of my best friends actually drove all the way from Alabama that morning and uh yeah they, they gave me a big hug and were like how light are you on bass track I was like well I just made it a little bit lighter about five minutes ago I mean, he just jumps in the boat and gives me like the biggest hug. We started like crying and yeah, whatever. Um, no, we don't. We don't cry. Cool. We're men. We don't cry. We, we don't, don't cry. cry. Ain't nobody <laughs> cried all week. Gosh. <laughs> and then and then Matt Robertson pulls up to the dock and says, "Good job, Justin." It's always wondering. You always are curious and probably trying to think in your mind. Are anglers just being kind, saying like "Good week," not knowing how good or bad you did on that final day, and they're just like. Hey, what's up, man? Good job this week. And uh, or if it's an indication of man, it was tough today, and and they assume I won. So it's always a weird trying to decipher yeah. it until, until the way in an hour and a half later. <laughs> and still, like even talking with Adam backstage, it was like, but dude, what what you really got? And he's like, I got eighteen pounds. I was like, oh gosh, he's got twenty four. He's like, no, no, dude, I, I swear, I promise, I, I wouldn't do this to you, whatever. I was like, all right. And I told him, you know, straight up, I didn't know ex- my exact weight because I didn't even weigh that last one. But it's like, this is what I had, and I think I made about a pound coal. And, uh, yeah, he, he was he was cool, though. And I'm glad he wasn't lying. <laughs> <laughs> I was still so nervous. Like, when, it, when I was sitting there backstage, and I think somebody actually got it on – video but right before they pulled me out and i was sitting there listening and i hear his weight get called out that's when it hit me like it hit me like a ton of bricks man that was crazy that's that's one of the things it's funny you you mentioned that because i had played this whole scenario through my head sitting out in the crowd or in the the dot-com room that like what if what if adam in that scenario was like dude i'm not telling you what i got like, how much would that kill you? Like, but I got him. Have, I got him. You might, literally have, you might literally have a heart attack before you ever made it to the stage just waiting. Um, oh, my gosh. That would be awful. But, but Ronnie mentioned it. You I know, stopped I, putting him in at 1030, Justin, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, and thanks. you know I've had a good afternoon bite every day. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But Ronnie, Ronnie mentioned it. Obviously, the, the video that he clipped the last like 10 minutes of your day that's kind of kind of gone crazy here the last couple of days, you know, catching that fish and then going to the way or going to the ramp. Like 
it was so obvious to me watching that like you genuinely did not know like which way to think like did I just blow it or did I win? And like at that given moment, like I can only imagine this is really not even a question. I'm just talking because I don't have anything to ask. But like, <laughs> I don't even know how you quantify that. Like you could be, you could have known instantly you won right then, or you could have like still thought you blown it and you had no idea either way, which is has to be like, and then you got like a six and a half hour drive to Tulsa from the lake to think about it, which is just crazy. <laughs> I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to how to quantify that. Like that's just a crazy thought. But um yeah, I, I like I said, I, I don't even <laughs> I'm glad there was not a camera in that truck. Cause my buddy I was like, dude, you've got to drive. Like I, I can't right now. So luckily them two were, you know, drove together. So one of them jumped in and drove me and I was like, let's just talk about cows or something on the side of the road. Like just quit talking about fishing i can't handle it, <laughs> it so was, question it did was, you did you drive uh, past kyle patrick when he blew his tire out or were you in in front of him and you didn't see him on the side of the road because i would have been like man dang it adam's on the side of the road i'm just gonna have to let him be there <laughs> <laughs> i did not even know that happened yeah i was in front of him but i didn't know that even happened yeah he blew his tire out some random dude named chad helped fix his tire so he could get back to tulsa and and kyle obviously ended up finishing seventh or something like that but um that's funny Tell tell us a little bit. Um, the Bassmaster Classic uh, is a, is a a memory and a dream for so many kids. And I got to talk to you each day and kind of toy with you in the interview room and get you to say things that that you probably didn't want to as a grown man talk about and the thoughts. But um, I didn't cry back there either. No, not at all. It <laughs> uh, <laughs> it uh, it kind of started to hit you day two. It hit a lot of people when I asked them to say this. Say. You know, I'm Justin Hamner, and I'm five bass away away from winning the Bassmaster Classic. That in itself, we all dream as kids to of winning the classic, but really, the first real dream is the same dream of I want to have the ball with ten seconds left on the clock and have the chance to shoot the game winning shot. And if it goes down, I win the championship. That's the same type of thing as I want a shot going in the final of the classic, and so. Uh, were there some six, seven, eight-year-old Justin Hamner feelings coming up of like, I don't want to fail and lose the classic here. I really want to complete the the wire to wire and win it. But boy, little Justin would be proud of that. Big Justin's even in this opportunity and position to to maybe win this thing. I ain't gonna lie. When you sit me down, dude, please don't ever change that. By the way. When you sit down in that chair and you're, you know, doing the whole leaning over the chair in front of you, and yeah, that that is such an iconic deal. And all I could think about was, yeah, that little Justin Hammer. dude. How many times I've sat there and caught like a 13 inch on Lake Tuscaloosa and like <laughs> held it up and never give up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, ain't no doubt. It, yeah, just to be sitting there is special. I think that's why it hits so hard though. Whenever you ask that, whenever you just say that, it's like really making me say it just makes it kind of real. And it, it none of it seemed real. It was wild. You like suck, during the- <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Hey, Adam had to do, Adam did three takes. He hadn't messed up all interview. He had to do three takes to get that right. And some other guys were like, whoa that's a weird statement for you to make me say so don't worry it wasn't just you there was a lot of people who were like okay brother <laughs> we yeah. only show we only show the one who ends up winning that that was you know there's a lot of people who were five bass away and and boy they hope they get another shot to be five bass away well if i'm in that situation again next year you just have to use that one again <laughs> <laughs> no, you're again. gonna have milo's on the front of your jersey next year okay well photoshop <laughs> also justin i wouldn't feel that bad about it because i mean i would say like at least eight out of ten times that i have to talk to ronnie i cry too but it's just because i don't want to talk to him it's pain so. and misery pain and misery yeah, it's, it's just yeah, a, that... it's just a painful experience so uh, i i completely understand yours are um, just tears of anger yeah. uh. the the one thing i did want to ask because i i think every year I, I said this a handful of times before the final weigh-in i think that probably the coolest like 
I don't know, 15 minutes in bass fishing during the entire season, like winning the classic being number one, probably right behind it is just the entire super six, like that experience, like walk me through, I see the smile on your face. Cause like, I feel like that has to be like, if you, if, if you didn't win the classic, like that experience alone has to be like the coolest thing of all time. Like what was like the moment where like all the emotions just like took over you? Because like, I think, I know Ronnie does the same thing. Like I was holding back tears, just watching it, like in the crowd. Like I love yeah, it, dude. Every year. Walk us, walk us through what that's like. That video that whoever edited that video together, David Lipke, right before. Oh my gosh! Shout out, they uh, crushed it. That that video, all six of us were just sitting back there, and we're like, "Oh crap, yeah, <laughs> this is it." And then you're like, we we saw it, you know, at the beginning of you know during the night of champions, y'all played it, and dude, it was pretty freaking special then but then y'all actually added us into it at the end and it just freaking hit home no much more but then when you walk out and dave apparently i wasn't supposed to hug dave i was excited <laughs> sorry <laughs> um when when we get to walk out and that whole freaking crowd is just going nuts that's gosh it was cool i, I see why people say like i want to do this again like One's cool, but now it just makes me want the next one so much more. I can see that. That is so very cool. And the other really cool part of it, when I was thinking about the top 10, you know, at one point during the tournament, our entire camera coverage featured every single level of BASS competition with a winner of some sort. And even our Super 6 resembled that, even though, like, there wasn't the final six in the standings. It's just the six going into the final day. You had Cody Huff, who had won a college classic bracket and a national championship at the college level. You had Adam, who obviously had won at the Opens level. You had, uh, you know, Hank Cherry, two-time classic champion. You had Cooper Gallant, his, who's fished juniors in high school and all these levels, and he's an international angler. And then yourself, who has made a name for himself but hasn't got the opportunity to close the door and they're chasing you is very cool to see all of those different levels. Um, I think uh, who else was in the super six? I'm trying to think of the six. It was you, uh, Coop, um, Hank, Cody Huff, Adam. Who was the other one? It wasn't Jay. Who was in there? Livesey. Wow. Was it Brandon Card? No, yeah. Brandon, was Brandon Card? Card. It was Card. Card. Yeah, Card. it was Card. Brandon Card. Yes, he was fourth going in the final day. Yeah, and so it's and he was the first ever college angler on the elite series. So it's crazy to think of how many levels of BASS had victors represented, and then you get your first BASS victory amongst them. It was very very cool. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, I've been safe. I, I didn't want to win any of those other ones. <laughs> That's why I almost won the first classic. It's just like I wanted to start out with the classic hey, win so hey might as well might as well. almost screw that up in texas tournament. yeah exactly <laughs> tell us about the uh tell us about the confetti uh angel the snow angel and confetti on the front deck of the boat it was honestly you were you were sitting up you were standing pointing to the crowd fist bump and cheering hugging your family so many things in that short boat drive through um but it did seem like for a moment there no one was in the arena and it was just mom dad wife and daughter confetti and justin and you guys were having your own conversations on the boat in, in the midst of it tell us about what that's like because uh 56 get to fish the classic one gets to experience that i didn't even remember that by the way um <laughs> somebody the next morning is like dude um <clears throat> that that confetti angel that was like priceless i was like yeah my daughter's hilarious and they're like no you i'm like what? And then they show me the picture. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that was me. I was like, Dude, I don't even remember that. That was nuts. But yeah, um, that was a special moment. Just seeing my my daughter has no idea what just happened. She was just happy there was confetti. But just seeing the joy in her eyes, and I think she just fed off of, you know, everybody else's emotions because, I mean, she's four years old. She don't care she literally told me she wanted me to go catch some big catfish for day one <laughs> um so i could win and but yeah 
I can't wait for her to look back in a few years and like when she actually realizes how this changed all of our lives and it was special and you dang right I had my parents up there I wasn't about to do that without them they they've been so supportive of me but oh yeah. don't worry they weren't gonna let you not do it I went and ch- checked with the Adams <laughs> family and your family and I said who's who's coming up on stage uh if he were to win and your dad said oh me and his mom and his wife and his daughter and I was like okay perfect well y'all better be ready because right after the the trophy hole we got to go or like we got to go right before it and and you can watch it but we got to get closer to that stage um and I'll say there's moments I think when you handed your dad the trophy he went like like you'll have to watch the footage again he like oh, oh my gosh like his his face it was so cool I took a photo of him um in the crowd I had I had gotten down to the floor and he's still standing on the stairs watching right there at the edge and I took a photo of him just holding his phone up so proud of his boy and then your your step rail on the outside of your boat trailer has that big pole and it was blocking your face when you were pulling th- around with the confetti so I couldn't take a photo of that but the photo I got you can see your wife in the tunnel staring at you with such a level of pride in her eyes and I know you are blacked out can't remember it very very cool those are the moments that make husbands fathers anglers proud is is to see the people around him who have sacrificed so much to, to to experience that and so i got to see it all it was very very cool up close and personal stop crying jesse <laughs> <clears throat> yeah it was it was pretty freaking awesome Dude, i don't know i've said it a thousand times but that that's truly what it was that's where all these emotions come from like because of them i'm excited because i got to hold that trophy that trophy doesn't carry value like what it means to this emotion side of what i put my family through like that trophy's always been my childhood dream and everything and then to realize what we had to go through just to get to that point that that's the emotion that's coming out and now that we can actually I can be on the road and not have to worry about everything that's going on back home. Um, you know, it, has, it means a lot. And you mm. could tell because that was that was something you even talked about on day two at the weigh-in. Like, I think there was a moment in time where I think you realized when you were on stage talking to Dave or, uh, you know, that you looked out and you saw your wife and your daughter there and, and like, you, you like kind of pause for a minute because I think it like hits you in that moment and like it's weird just even as a fan and like somebody that appreciates the sport like it even crossed my mind before you weighed in like I wanted to find your family just to see their reaction as much as I did you know yours because like I can only imagine like what that's like and you know I think that you've done such a good job you know exemplifying that and and you know those emotions feel real you know what I mean like I don't know how to explain that but you've done such a good job of like like allowing other people to know what that means to you. Like that's, that's not an easy thing to do, but like I, you can feel it and it's real. And I've, I appreciate it a ton because I think from a fan perspective, like I sat there in the way in and watched that and I could feel it. Like it was awesome. Like super, super awesome, but I'll spare you from, from any more tears. I thank got a goodness. fishing question. And thank goodness thank you. your wife was wearing pink because it was easy for me to point to photographers. They're like, where's the Hamner's family? It's the lady <laughs> on the front row wearing pink right there. And then the two people beside of her are the parents. And so they were, I was like, it's easy, easy. Go Perfect. ahead, <laughs> no, So like I said, we'll, we'll talk about some yes, manly. Let's, transi- talk let's about transition fishing. to fishing. Yes. Fast fishing. <laughs> So what what I was going to ask you, so one thing that has crossed my mind a lot was like Ronnie and I always do a a podcast previewing each event and we do fantasy picks and this, that, and the other. And there were a lot of people that felt like Grand Lake suited your style well. Like the two things, like two of the main things you're well known for in throwing a jig and, and throwing a jerk bait, you know, foreshadowing a little bit was a huge part of the reason, you know, people had so much confidence in you in this tournament you know before the tournament ever even started like once you knew you qualified did you feel like it it set up well for you like what were your feelings before you ever even got to the lake 
hundred percent. I think that's why I was, uh, I was very confident coming into this one. I've never been to Grand Lake before, but I think it was the one Cliff Pace one when he won it off the jig, just going down the bank, throwing a jig. But Hank Cherry was second, throwing a jerk bait. It's like I can do that. <laughs> you can know, make that work. <laughs> <laughs> I can make that combo happen. Yeah, uh, no doubt. But I think the biggest thing was actually how much these those fish change day to day. It seems like it is a very good pattern lake, but that pattern changes daily. And I am very used to that by this awful, terrible body of water that I live by. Um, you can't do the same thing two days in a row. Like, And I'm comfortable with that. I'm, heck, I fished an area I've never even fished before on the phone on a day of the classic you know I'm, I'm comfortable with making those quick decisions and just get me in an area that has a bunch of different things kind of happening and i can just go fishing and then figure out which one's good for the day and roll with it so yeah i, I like that kind of fishing you mentioned in your tackle tip that we shot uh in the after the press conference on sunday night uh about your comfortability with jerk baits. So tell me, break down not a not a full seminar, but maybe a pseudo seminar on jerk bait fishing that you had a deep one, you had a shallow one, you had some short ones or small ones, you had some big ones, and how you were explaining using all four of those variations, deep, shallow, big, small, allow you to really fine tune a bite and and almost have them all on the front deck at any you know, moment to make a quick switch and be completely comfortable and not, not in the uh, trial and error period because you already have done that in practice. So explain a little bit of the jerk bait knowledge that you have um, that you were able to implement when it was game time. Um, yeah, I could talk for days about just, I mean, how much time I've spent on the water with it. it it's just one of those baits that I've always, yeah, I'm comfortable with it and confident with it, but it's like the big one is for like when I can tell those fish start getting more aggressive. And if it's super windy, those bigger ones, you know, obviously I can cast it further and things like that, but it's like the more aggressive fish. And when those fish are like, seem like they're more focusing on like the gizzard shad and bigger bait profiles. Um, and then obviously the small one is like when they really start getting keyed in on that super small bait, it seems like, cause all the jerk baits we throw, I mean, realistically are way bigger than the shad these fish eat. Um, but whenever they start to seem like they're really getting dialed in on that, whatever specific size, you have to really go smaller. So that's why I do that. But like the shallow and the deep, that deep one, I mean, and there's still like four different variations of the deep one I throw. But like depending on how the fish are coming to it, how I have to work the bait. Like one of the jerk baits is really good for like barely tapping the rod and making it do the body roll. And then other ones are like really good for being able to, you know, work it super fast retrieves. And then some of them are good for like just doing the old winter time, like where you just pull the bait kind of deal and it has a good swim. So I don't know. It's just that bait can do so many different things that not just your traditional jerk, jerk, pause, you know, it, it's way, way beyond that. And I put a couple of hours in throwing a jerk bait. Do you remember the first time you covered me, Jesse, when you came to Lake Tuscaloosa with me? I do. Yeah. I was gonna, I was going to ask two questions that were, that were related to that trip. So question number one, is you said, you've spent a couple of hours. How many dollars have you spent on jerk baits if you had to guess? We ain't talking about that. That's a scary <laughs> number. <laughs> I don't even know. I've never <laughs> seen so many jerk baits in my whole life in one yeah. place. You couldn't go to Bass Pro Shops and find more jerk baits in their aisles. I'm oh, confident. Yeah. It's Two. getting bad because now other like of the guys on you know tour they know I got like every jerk bait ever made so it's like hey, <laughs> hey I can i bomb this one like, yeah. oh crap <laughs> yeah you still owe me some tyler um that's but, funny yeah. the, the second question or it's not even a question it was just a kind of a hope and I, it never even crossed my mind until like day two of the classic is I, you probably remember this too at one point in time i guess it was like last year or the year before 
you had told me about a specific jerk bait that they didn't make anymore. And you had given me strict orders that if I'd ever see them anywhere, like when I was tackle shopping or something to let you know, and this wasn't directly related to any tournament or anything, but I found some and I called him and I said, Hey, do you want me to get you these? He said, yeah, I was really hoping you would win the classic on that jerk bait. So you could give me credit on stage. <laughs> for <getting> these random <laughs> <jerk baits. laughs> That's funny. Just a random, oh. a random little small tackle store in like Clinton, Arkansas, or somewhere. I just like happened to stop and yeah. I found them. And I was like, God, I don't even know why does this place even have these. And I sent him a picture. I was like, Do you want them? He's like, Yeah, get them. I was like, all right. Yeah, That's awesome. <laughs> Patrick actually stole one of those from me <laughs> and then broke it off on floor. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> of course. The people who you could have a bait for twenty years in your tackle box and nothing wrong with it, less the second you let someone borrow it, it's gone. Yeah. Break it gone. in half on a causeway, something. Um. <laughs> So I'm still I'm still intrigued on the on the jerk bait stuff and so obviously it's trial and error um you know there have been some comments because people love to just pop off at the mouth so of course I tend you know even though Tommy Sanders tells me not to pop off at the mouth I tend to still do it in response and the comment of the day today on Thursday March 28th says Betty couldn't have caught a fish without live scope video game fishing and I responded and said, <laughs> you would have bet incorrectly then. So please tell me how you use the trial and error to know I'm going to throw the bigger size jerk bait when they're being aggressive. So explain how without seeing them reacting live on, on live scope, how you would notice a fish was aggressive. Is it how hard they weld the bait? Is it where they get it when they bite it that you assume they're aggressive and then you put it on and it works? Is it having to catch two at a time, seeing them one at the boat chase it before forward-facing sonar? Because because you said in an interview with me, you were doing what you would do back home instinctually with a jerk bait, going down the bank, picking apart cover, and keying in on certain things. But now with live scope, you're able to be more efficient and see fish that wouldn't have bit on the first cast and catch them again. So before forward facing sonar, how would you tell it was time to use the big one? Uh, obviously regurgitated bait can show you the small one or certain cadences um, because you did figure that out prior, most likely. Oh, absolutely. The Honestly, the worst thing that could have ever happened for, for my jerk bait vision was the forward facing sonar because then everybody else started throwing it. Um <laughs> because the suspended fish have always intrigued me and honestly this is the only bait that suspends that that is to me the most natural presentation that and a drop shot a drop shot is so effective because it suspends off the bottle those are the only two baits i know about that actually seems in my slow alabama mind that it is just like every other real bait fish out there because every other bait fish isn't just sitting on the bottom and just running across the bottom like a crankbait or, you know, stuff like that. So, but whenever I was fishing it, if those fish are coming in and obviously, I mean, just straight up sideways, I mean, got it just head shot, stuff like that. That's when, you know, for one, you're using the right color. And for two, I mean, you're obviously working it at the right cadence. But for me, it's about, every cast i'm changing it up like when i'm in pull up to like a lay down i'm not just throwing one cast at that lay down and then you know rolling it's multiple casts first cast i mean i'm probably gonna do just whatever had been working earlier in that day but just start off with something next cast either i'm gonna pause it for a long time or then i'm gonna start working it fast but um i play the colors by the conditions you know there's times that just some lakes seem you know like those fish kind of like a certain color more than others but 99 percent of the time i only have like four or five different colors i use and depending on what the conditions are with the water clarity and with cloud or sun that that that's what makes me choose you know which color to use and you know now obviously with the four phasing sonar you can see some days Oh, this isn't the best, but I'm still going off how they're eating that thing. Because whenever they come up and there's no hesitation, they don't sit there and have to follow it and chase it and nip at it. When they just come up there and hit it, 
that's when it's going to be headshotted or just sideways in their mouth and you got it dialed in. So, yeah. With, well, with know, that, oh, go ahead, Kyle. What were you going to say? I was going to say, like, I, I know that this answer is more complex than the way I'm going to ask it, but, like, for somebody that maybe is not a, a big jerkbait fisherman, and there's plenty of people that, like, don't like a jerkbait because it requires some effort. Like, it requires a good bit of effort. Like, the most simple way you could describe, like, your color choices, like, is it more like, you know, dense, like, solid colors when it's cloudy, like, sunny, more translucent? I know, like, water clarity has a big factor. How could you, like, describe that as simple as possible for somebody that maybe uh, is convinced to throw a jerk bait now? Yeah, so muddy or dirtier water is more of the, you know, solid or brighter colors, like the more just bright whites or pearl or whatever and um that kind of goes the same when it's cloudy i really i really like the more translucent sometimes when it's cloudy i don't need to say that but it <laughs> seems like to me um because if you think about it, those fish that are looking up and when it's a super sunny bright day they can't tell really what's going on up there but if it's cloudy those fish can see too good that's when i want the most natural just like that's when i'll start going to translucent and stuff like that because that's when i think that those fish can see their best so yeah so, and whenever it's sunny i want something shiny <laughs> in one quick swoop we might have just given away like one of the biggest secrets of yours because that's like the opposite of what i've heard a hey. lot of guys if they're listening 55 minutes into the podcast, basically, <laughs> then kudos to them. They deserve, they deserve that tip. Um, Don't I, just cut that little clip and just put it out there. Make them work. For yes, I want to make them work for Hey, we do that. When we do the previews, oh, no. the last five minutes of the episode, I reveal who's on Bass Live for day one of that tournament later in the week so that people, if they want to know, I just send them the link to the podcast and say, Hey, we talked about it in the podcast and they got to figure out where we talked about it. So don't <laughs> worry. That's not the, that's not the first time. Um, something you mentioned to me as well. So grand, I, I kind of pictured it. It sets up as three different lakes. You've got Wolf Creek up where it's dirtier, warmer water. You've got the bridge right there below Wolf Creek down towards Horse Creek, that's Mid Lake, even though it's still some territory, you got Echo Bay, Honey Creek, Shangri-La, Horse Creek, all those right there in the Mid Lake. Then below there, the last turn down to Duck and, and Drowning is Lower Lake. We were talking about how the water discrepancy or the water temperature discrepancies down south. I'm a I'm not a cold weather fisherman, cold water fisherman. So I would tend to, as soon as water starts warming, I'm gonna go where the warmest water is, the more active fish, those things. But we talked about controlling the controllables and you wanted the most stability as possible. And when we're coming out of winter, going into the spawn phase, the most stable is the actual colder, cooler water temps because they've been there for the last four months. So is that something, is that a rule of thumb Justin Hamner is always using? Or was that something you set up this week knowing that it's more north than Louisiana and Texas where we were for the elites? So these fish are going to be back a stage. And I don't want to catch the fish as they're on their way switching. I'd rather catch them where they're fully in one of those stages. So is that why you chose the cooler water to begin with and stuck in that region from horse, you know, down? Yeah, you're just letting it all out, ain't you, Ronnie? Hey, I would have, you know, I just tried I to I got the trophy. I don't care. <laughs> uh, yeah, 100%. That I want, regardless of what time of year it is, I want to find the fish that are in – that whatever pattern they've been in the longest that is the most predictable i don't want the deal where it's like they're about to pull up and start spawning any day and it's just like the matter of time of waiting on them to pull up or then something you know we get a cold night and they pull off and everything's just like too unpredictable i want those fish that are you know hopefully a little bit deeper more predictable if something changes in the weather those fish aren't just going to freak out and make them run all the way back. I'm sorry. I'm boring you, Ronnie. No, um, I am. I'm still I'm catching up trying. on the class. I am catching up on the classic boy. I am tired. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I don't have Milo's keeping me fueled. So I was sitting here like, good Lord. It's been, it's Thursday. I feel like classic ended yesterday still. I, I swear. I thought it was Wednesday. <laughs> I was talking to my wife. I was like, what do we got today for Wednesday? And she's like, 
yeah you did that yesterday oh all right <laughs> but um i don't even know what we were talking about see what you we talking about derailed birds? yourself no we weren't talking about birds i don't think uh -oh. we we're talking about uh -oh. fish spawning and cold fronts and keeping it in a normal <laughs> consistent pattern uh -oh. yeah. i'm not add i promise um <laughs> but yeah i, I want to find the most cons you know fish that are going to be the most reliable and to me that and plus this time of year the pre-spawn fish are the heaviest like those fish that start pulling up they kind of slack off you know they kind of slack off on feeding up they're they're getting ready to like do the deal and they're not just gorging themselves yeah. anymore they're getting it, egg it's... weight they're getting the temporary weight yeah yeah absolutely so these fish you know they've got a lot of eggs but they're still you know just feeding up like crazy i mean I don't know if you saw, well, I guess you saw Ronnie, but my fish were fat. <laughs> like they were butter balls. Catching 11 inch spots at the beginning of the morning. And you're like, they're going to give you some big ones. And then one's just like, Bloom. yep, there you go. It wasn't like, they wasn't like the longest giant fish, but like the average of those, instead of it being like that two and a half pound average is what I found like more up around that Honey Creek area. And they were just kind of slender and not that very well built. Those fish, whenever I'd catch like a 15 inch, it would be like a, I mean, it'd be a good fish just because of how big and fat they were. So I like those. Awesome. Uh, I, I was just thinking about, cause I just clipped off your interaction with the goose. Um, and so I was like, man, we need to showcase that again. But it seems like Grand Lake is great for classics but there's always some kind of wildlife conflict like the dog with ike and then now a goose with you that goose pretty, i mean he did he not like wanted me <laughs> he did not you're like just go home man just go home uh, it just kept going and then he went to like my best lay down and just like sat right in the middle and started flopping around and grabbed Stupid you might have won. You might have locked it up by noon. We, he was actually a paid actor. Adam Rasmussen yeah. paid him to do yeah. that. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Did you see it on day three? I when believe I up into that creek. I, I can't remember which day that. I guess day two we got introduced to it, and then day three. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, I go back into the creek. That son of a gun, like it was in the back of that creek like sitting there with his wife you know that was sitting on the eggs and everything that was like at the back this son of a gun was sitting on top of the very first boat dock like on the roof of it just sitting there just like and as soon and, as i roll in it starts honking and you <laughs> and you hooked up and it just got like lands right in your trolling motor and it's like oh, whoa gosh. i'm fighting a fish <laughs> yeah that was the day two but no day yes. three it was waiting on me to come back and that's hilarious uh, yeah Stupid you brought a bunch of other eyeballs and boat traffic and he's like why won't this one dude just brought all of his friends in here that's my last question uh kyle can ask another one but my last question is how cool is it or fearful is it to have a flotilla because it seems like grand lake is just like east tennessee or just like central alabama fishing fans are heavy in there and and i'm not talking about their weight i'm talking about density of fishing fans there's a lot of them and so you have a bunch of Grand Lake flotillas following you around and you probably thought they were bored watching you one guy fish, you know, instead of watching live, but they get some se special satisfaction out of watching up close and personal someone win the classic. So that had to be, you kind of probably had to catch yourself throughout the day and stay focused on like, man, that's, that's freaking cool that these people have been out here since 6 AM. Honestly, exactly what you said. I was like, dang, I need to, they going to catch more fish, do something cool. Like, ah, oh, I ain't caught one in a while. But, dude, they stuck with me until the end. Like, that was awesome. I loved it. I don't it, care how tight it was in that creek. They're, everybody, those were, like, the most respectful dudes. Like, they, it was fun. Are there any you remember? You know, sometimes there's little kids with signs or, like, I've been in a flotilla before in a Bassmaster Classic watching at Lay Lake, so I know what we were thinking. Is there any that stuck out to you of, I remember that father son, or I remember that neon green boat out there, or something. Just <laughs> you, you always see the same guy, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, there was there was one guy that had like his two kids, and that was that was probably my favorite ones. I go by them and the kids, just, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. It's awesome. It was all pretty special. I got two things to to ask. One, I don't even know why. 
<laughs> nice pink cup, by the way. I don't know. I don't know why this even came to my my head. But was there ever anybody at any point in your life that like told you that like fishing professionally, like doing this as a job, like wasn't gonna wasn't realistic? Like somebody you could pick that trophy up behind your your shoulder, show it to him right now in this podcast, and say you're wrong. Like there's got to be somebody that you proved wrong like entirely in the last three days. Absolutely, Name I'll them. never forget this dude. <laughs> Throw them out there, Northern. baby. Let's go. <laughs> Northern. Um, but yeah, it was a guy that worked at the university. Um, it was my last day as I was as I quit. And everybody knew why I was leaving. It was it was the Chase's trophy. And um I was walking out, you know, they had like a party or whatever for my last day. And I was walking down the hall to get to the door, and I'm sure he didn't think I could still hear him, but all he said was, yeah, we'll see him again in about three months. Oh, uh, that's something. I would have went homeless before I came back there. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah. Yeah, when I remember him, no doubt. That's amazing. I figured you probably had at least somebody that you could hey, think you of. you should totally just go down on campus and just take the trophy <laughs> around and just walk by his department or door over and over again until you happen to see him. And you're like, oh, Sorry, it took a little more than three months. I came back after three <laughs> years, back. and I brought <laughs> something for you. You want to take a photo with me? Oh, please do it. Oh, uh, my gosh, please do Ronnie, it. Ronnie, you know I'm not a showboat. I can't do that. If but I came I would, to Alabama, like would I? could I drive you? We'll do I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. Dude, I'm a quick, okay. I'm a quick right, drive down the road. We yeah, can do you that. Do, you like, can do that this <laughs> afternoon. Like, what are you talking about? You got two things, Kyle. You got to take him as jerk bait from the photographers, and you've got to – Take him to uh, Tuscaloosa to to do the the walkthrough. <laughs> All right, come okay. on, come on. The actual last question I have, and like it's funny to even ask something like this because when I when I thought about this, I I, I think back to Greg Hackney before he won Aoy at Cayuga. He he like has this interview, and Ronnie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he literally gets mad. He's like, "It's always something. Like you can never be satisfied. Like that's the thing that's wrong with this sport. It's like you accomplish one thing, and you think like it's smooth sailing, but then there's like the next thing." Justin Hamner, you're sitting in fourth in AOY points. Why not <laughs> let's just go win Angler of the Year too while we're at it? <laughs> Might as well. That's like nothing. Honest, that's easy. In all in all seriousness, though, like. How excited are you like to get back to fishing now that like, like in a, in a way, like you have nothing to lose, like literally nothing to lose. Like how fun is that going to be for you to get back on the elite series? Like carefree, not carefree. That's not the right word, but you know what I'm saying? Like you have, you have far less pressure on you the rest of the season than you did before. Missing like, checks oh. don't hurt as bad now. <laughs> exactly. But, like, in a way that could help you. Like that's, that's the funny thing about it. Like, you know, the less pressure that might be the key to, you know, to winning a like how excited are you to get back to actually fishing? I cannot wait. Um, dude, if you look back to last year, I quit, I, you know, my final, I don't know. I finally quit cutting lawns, uh, like towards the end of spring last year, like right there before, Santee Cooper and all that stuff and uh because I didn't have to worry about trying to make a check anymore like I finally got to that point and dude fishing free like the rest of the year besides those stupid redfish at the Sabine River those suckers got me I thought I was gonna win that tournament <laughs> hey we may have to have you them. at the redfish cup since you're sporting a Yamaha we might have to have you at the redfish cup and you might have to actually be fishing for them this year we'll have to see about that that's fine. I will crush them on a buzz bait. That was actually a pretty <laughs> fun bite. <laughs> like, dude, I was cracking them. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, but yeah, no, ever since then, I've been able to fish, you know, just be able to not have to worry about trying to make a cut. And what, like, what Pollinic always talks about, like, if you're trying to fish for that cut, you know, the check, it's like you finish, like, right below. It. And it's like, more, more I got more comfortable of I wasn't worried about like trying to analyze and overanalyze where I'm going to go and what I need to do to try to get to this much. It was just literally going out there and 
I couldn't tell you how many times last year I've just went fish places that I've never even seen before and caught them. Like it turned out really good. Like 92 top 25s in a row. You've, you've been on our streak since you put down the, the mower keys. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. It's been good. It's, so. it's one of those things. That, and I guess you can explain that probably there's some financial relief that allows you to step away from having that, but it's, I've always seen it with other anglers as well as they have that backup plan of a job at home. And so it's always in those lean years of fishing or tough stretches. They're like, thank goodness I have that steady income back home when I'm home. But then they never get to be the absolute best they can be on the water because they always have something pulling them home. They're needed at home for this, needed at home for work. And so you have one foot in plan B, one foot in plan A, and you never really get to see what plan A comes to fruition. You have now taken that jump and the last, not calendar year, maybe in a month or so it would be a calendar year. That has probably been the best stretch of nine or ten events of Justin Hamner's career, and it's when he finally decided, if I'm going to make this thing a real deal, I've got to see it through, and then you do it, and you end up having a great New York swing, a great smallmouth swing at St. Clair included. You start the year out great. You win the Bassmaster Classic. You probably won Tuesday nighters that you wouldn't have won otherwise. You know, Congratulations, but how scary is that to actually take that safety and security and and get even more because you've you've maxed out your potential somewhere else yeah i think it's i mean it's gonna be good i got to fish like this whole off season i fished more during this off season than i've ever fished in my life and it was obviously it turned out to be working pretty good but just getting time on the water is so crucial in this yeah now that i actually get to have that time on the water and that that's what allows yourself to make these decisions so freely and trust in yourself. So I ain't saying we ain't going to win the AOI, but like that's still a hard, that's a long season left. So. You're like the oldest one in the top 10. So you might as well, like you're the veteran of the top 10 right now. What are you, how old are you? 34, 32, 33. 33. Okay. You're right there with Milliken. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll give you a Yeah. Pass. Milliken's way older. Yeah, yeah. Don't he's, be throwing me in the 34 old. and a half over here. Um, he's got just the longer, <laughs> he's got a little bit longer hair than you. If you didn't, if you didn't cut yours or trim yours, then, but you, but you live with a haircut professional. So you gotta, you gotta get it trimmed yeah. up really good. That's, uh, that's why I, I lied. I've got, I've got one more. What's the first, have you made an atypical Justin Hamner purchase? Something you would, like, you know, oh, I got a nice steak dinner. Well, you probably would have gotten a steak dinner at some point. Is there something you've purchased so far that you would not have purchased on a 15th place finish or an 18th place finish or a regular finish winning the classic? Have you purchased Disneyland tickets yet or Disney World tickets yet? Please please say a flamethrower or something <laughs> cool. Flamethrower. I got a foot long at so boy. I usually just go for the six inch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> good. I'm glad to I see it hasn't gone to your head. You got four days in, though. We'll see what next week holds. I've never had money, so it's like now that I have a little bit of money, it, I want to keep that money in mind. <laughs> good. <laughs> Screw y'all. Good. Have you ever heard of uh, Dogecoin? I do not recommend investing. This is not. No, I'm just kidding. Don't don't invest in in that. Um. Awesome. Yeah, well, Justin, main coin. No. we will, uh, we'll let you go, man. Maybe we'll create a roll tide coin after this. I don't know, but, um, uh, congratulations. 2024 Bass Pro Shops, Bassmaster Classic champion presented by Jockey Outdoors, Justin Hamner. He got all the dough. I think you got the big bass of the turn or the big, uh, the big yeah. bag of the tournament and, uh, and all the bragging rights you could ever ask for. Congratulations, man. Thank you for being on the podcast today. Dude, thank y'all for having me. It was fun. Kyle, you don't have any, we can't have any more questions back there from you. I'm good. I'm I'm straight. All right, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> no. Justin, thank you. Be good, and we will see you. Uh, hopefully, the Birmingham crew sees you stop by the headquarters before Florida. But otherwise, we may we may just go ahead and throw you on camera day one of the Harris chain. Just to, and you've been good on camera the last couple times. We'll just keep. I think we've had you on camera like seven straight days of competition. From a uh, fork to, uh, I mean, you've been on camera like 10 times this year. So keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah, it's been good. Y'all are finally recognizing my beauty. Hey. Thank you. Fast lawnmower <laughs> racer. 
the most handsome man on tour, good hair, and now he's got the trophy to back it up. There we go. Awesome. Congratulations. Hey, <laughs> thank y'all for having go, me. Yeah. Finish finish off that Milo's paperwork and we will uh we'll see you in Florida. Roll tide. <laughs> Kyle Justin Hamner, our Bassmaster Classic champion man, super cool. What a genuine human, what a good good guy and uh a jolly representative for the Bassmaster community. Um I have tried to fight tooth and nail to prevent anybody from trying to asterisk his tournament or say he's not worthy of winning one. You you qualify for the big dance and you could be the Cinderella that wins it. Maybe he was lower odds than people, you know, thought or he was higher odds than people expected. No matter how it worked out, he was in the big dance and he took full advantage of the big dance and won the tournament. What an awesome, what an awesome life moment for him. It really was. And it was, it was such a, a fun thing. I mean, being at the classic is always fun and getting to see that moment happen in real time. Like that's something that's hard to, to beat, but like, I've said this since like the first time I was ever around Justin, like, which we, which one of the first times was the time that he referenced on the podcast, but like people like assume that he's just quiet and like, you know, doesn't talk a lot or what, I don't even know what people's assumptions are. I really don't know. But, like, he's one of the funniest human beings, like, I've ever been around. Like, has a very, like, sarcastic personality, like, sense of humor, like, the same way that we are. Like, it, it is it is so much fun to be around Justin Hamner. So, like, I mean, you couldn't imagine a, a better classic champion as far as that's concerned. Because, like, the more that we go on with this, like, the more comfortable he's going to get. And, like, I know that people are going to see that side of him more. Um, which people already know that. I mean, if you've listened to him talk and, you know, heard him on podcasts and things of that nature, like, you know, that to a degree, but uh, he really is, like you said, such a genuine human being and, and just executed the game plan perfectly. I mean, that's the thing when you look at it from a fishing standpoint, I mean, like we talked about, a lot of people had high expectations for Justin Hamner in this tournament. And we look so much in the past, you know, we look at history, we look at, at um you know how many times have you fished there like things of that nature never even fished there he said and and people like knew just because of his skill set that like that lake matched up well with his skill set and he wins like i mean just a very very impressive performance to lead the classic and and win wire to wire i mean it's is incredibly impressive with the guys that were behind him and the days that they had like there was really no room for error and, and, you know, I think he did exactly what he needed to do, obviously. And, and, you know, you clip in that uh, final 10 minutes of his day, like seeing that last catch, like would he won without it? Probably I'm guessing, yeah, but like, like probably like a pound, but he won by two that's, and three that's quarters, solidified you know? it. Like that was such a cool moment. Like that nobody really got to see. I'm guessing we went off of live, um, yeah. yep. was driving already. But I assume we were off alive. Like, what a what an awesome, awesome tournament. And now that, you know, it's over with, I imagine he'll get to watch that and, and just think about, like, all the emotions that were running through his head. Now that he knows how the tournament ends, like, how, you know, that he obviously wins. Like, what a what a cool experience for Justin. I mean, what a what a awesome. Especially awesome. especially because Seth Doman, his cameraman who rode with him, you know, the day two and day three, uh, kind of got him talking and was like, Hey man, what do you think about this? Before he even got up to that dock, and like I had already scrubbed through the footage and saw, oh, he catches it off that dock. I knew it was a dock, but I was like, man, this clip starts way before that dock. And then he talks, 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 get up there, switches four different baits when he's up there covering some ground, and then boom, catches that fish. I was so concerned he wasn't gonna call. I mean, he was he was running to the front of the boat, trolling away, making sure he didn't hit the bank with the wind, putting his trolling motor up, getting his life jacket ready. I gotta check, is this the right fish? It is the right fish. Okay, let me get strapped up, throw it in the water, start up and head back. Um, super cool for him. We were talking about it and he mentioned it that being a part of the super six makes you want to do it more. And Jason Christie had said when we did our um Tuesday interviews for TV, he said there is one negative of the Bassmaster Classic. When you win one, it makes you want to win another even worse. And I was like, that is that is a bad problem. That's a good problem to have, but that's a bad problem is those guys, there's a bunch of people who've won just one Classic. There's a bunch of people who've never won a Classic. And there's a select few who have won two. Nobody's ever won three. And then someone's, and two people have won four. So 
that's absolutely the mountain you want to climb. Kudos to Justin Hamner for doing so. Um, kudos to everyone who picked him and drained the lake because that's why I've plummeted this week. I didn't really have any terrible finishers, but boy, did those triple points pay off for some people. And I got passed big time <laughs> in the standing. So, um, yeah, Kyle Hamner's on a roll. He wins the classic and, uh, he does it, you know, over the first two events, he's not a forward facing sonar guy. That's a Demiki rig or a jig head minnow guy. He will do that, has done that probably, but at Toledo Bend, it was a big jig and some brush and and probably a little bit of a jerk bait action too. And then at Fork, it was jerking. You know, he was throwing a jerk bait most of the week and then a jerk bait here. So uh, the fact of the matter is we're going to have to start making a list of the best jerk bait fishermen on the Elite Series for the five, you know, or all time. You know, if we if we had to think about it, you'd put Patrick Walters probably in there. You'd throw Hank Cherry most definitely in there. You'd throw Kevin Van Dam in there for for overall all time. Um, maybe even a Mike McClelland in there. You're gonna see if he's not there yet in the next year or two. Justin Hammer's probably gonna be deemed that in a lot of people's eyes because of uh, how good he's done with it with electronics, but also with it um, prior leading up to it and his history with it. So. Um, we're going to need to have to, well, let's do that. Let's, let's do a podcast where we make, where we have a guest on. Let's do that in the future. have a guest on that's really good at a topic and have them pick their five current elite anglers or, and their five all time anglers for that technique. We'll have to do that. Cause that'd be interesting to see what some guys picked. So, um, well, Kyle, you good. Anything else you want to add to this? I do not. We're shooting this during opening day of uh, MLB season, and uh, you got to really, go. <laughs> that's, that's about all I can think about right you now. You said uh, not six thirty. You don't want to do it at six thirty because I'm guessing that's when the Rangers tee off. That is correct. Yes, six thirty <laughs> is uh, is go time. So uh, we got to defend that World Series championship. Well, for the Bassmaster viewers, I, I'm not tied to a baseball team, so you have me all summer, except for the NBA playoffs when my Nuggets play. That's about the only time. And when the Cardinals pick fourth in the NFL draft, that's about the only time. <laughs> well, Kyle, it was great talking with Justin Hamner, the 54th BASS uh, Classic Champion overall, uh, 54th rendition of it. Uh, congratulations to him, his whole family. Super cool to see his family there accept the award. I had to carry his wife's purse around. She dropped it off backstage to go on stage with him, and then they're in the boat together. I, I just took it with me. I just was like, we're not going to leave this whole bag of stuff. Just we're going to forget it backstage. So uh, it was great to see the family really soak it in. Um, well, for this episode of the podcast, it's in the books. We will see you soon. We don't have any tournaments this weekend. We have one tournament or two tournaments next weekend, but not of the live variety. I think there's a nation event and maybe high school or kayak or something. I think at least just the nation. And then we have the elites coming up in two weeks in Florida for the Harris chain. And then the St. John's river, which will be Rick Clun's 500th event more on the podcast. We'll have to discuss soon in the future episodes. We'll see you then.